In class today, we kid a few fun activities to try to keep track of all those Gs of glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, glycogenesis, and glycogenolysis. Easiest way to kind of picture it all is to, well, chart it out and actually follow these different pathways. So I took these um, like metabolic roadmap posters I made and I put them in a picture frame so that we could actually use whiteboard markers on them and be able to erase things. And I had the students kind of trace out the pathways of glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, glycogenesis, and glycogenolysis. Man, it's, yeah, it's a lot of Gs. But basically you can see that you can basically trace which enzymes are used for which pathway, which ones are shared, which ones are different. And then I had the students kind of like calculate how many ATP you could get if you went down various pathways. As well as think about, okay, well, if we took glucose and we made glycogen, how much is it gonna cost us really per glycogen? If we think about when we then go back from um, glycogen, actually take that glucose back, and then if we're in our muscles, we can burn it. If we're in our liver, we can let it out. And so this allows you to kind of think about what's gonna happen in what tissue based on seeing what enzymes you would need. Knowing that things like our G6PAs are only in our liver and our kidney, not in our muscle. And that our liver can also, not only can it free glucose that way, but it can actually do gluconeogenesis and make it. The, and as well as make, break it down from glycogen. Whereas our kidneys, they're not storing their glycogen, but they still have that G6PAs and they can still do gluconeogenesis and generate glucose that way. This was on the heels of us talking about glycogen metabolism and looking at sort of the various features that make it so that your liver and your muscle have different qualities when it comes to what they do with the glucose. And so we talked a lot about like hexokinase, how it's going to actually trap the, the glucose inside the cell and how you want a low affinity, uh, like a low activity, low affinity hexokinase in your liver cells so that you're not constantly trapping that glucose before you go to free it. But you want a higher affinity one in your muscles and in your brain and stuff so that you can trap in the glucose that you need but you don't want to trap in too much. And so that's where you have basically the fact that it's going to be inhibited by glucose 6-phosphate. One in your brain and the one in your muscles is going to get inhibited by glucose 6-phosphate so they don't hog too much. But the one in your liver, it's not going to be inhibited by that because you want your liver to be able to be taking in a bunch of glucose and not be inhibited. And so this we talked about, we analyzed some figures about how not only is the, the hexokinase important and not only is whether or not they have this glucose 6-phosphate important, but also the transport in itself. And so we're getting into kind of the metabol the hormonal regulation of these pathways and how the, the glut transporter that your muscle cells have, they're actually able to respond to insulin and put in those transporters in the cell surface in response to insulin, then they can take in a lot of sugar and they're going to be able to go through glycogen um, glycogenesis to make glycogen. And then if they need energy, they're gonna break that glycogen down, glycogenolysis, and go take it down all the way to pyruvate or even further if they want the big energy yield. Whereas your liver, it's not going to get the extra signal to taking glucose, but it's already getting like a ton of the glucose because it's like first stop. And it's not going to, it's not going to be inhibited if it takes in too much. But when your liver breaks it down, well, it's breaking it down to ship to other tissues. And so you can look and see how the glucose that was in your liver is actually going to get shipped out to other tissues. And then which tissues are going to take them up? Well, the ones that are going to take them up are the ones with those really high affinity um, transporters and those high affinity hexokinases because you want your brain to get the glucose when there's not that much around and your liver is going to be fine with that fatty acids and stuff. So if you trace out the pathways, then you can think about, okay, well, if I go this way, how many ATP equivalents do I need to use and how many do I get? And you'll see that basically it costs one ATP equivalent per, um, per glucose that you store. And then when you break it down, because you're using this glycogen phosphorylase, you're actually breaking it off as glucose 1-phosphate rather than as just free glucose. So you get to skip the hexokinase step and go straight down the pathway. And so by tracing this out and kind of looking and seeing where you're spending ATP, where you're making ATP, and kind of the net balance, this is going to be a helpful way, hopefully, that you and hopefully my students were able to see 
the differences, the different paths that glucose could take and kind of like the energetic differences and how, yes, it is energetically um, pretty efficient to save as glycogen. You still do have to put in one extra ATP because you have to consider that you do still need that trapping step before you go and add another ATP, well, a UTP, in order to get the energy you need to link up into glycogen. So that leads to our second activity, where basically I printed out some of the structures of ATP and UTP, as well as inorganic phosphate and glucose, and a little model of glycogenin, which is the protein at the heart of glycogen, because that's where the glycogenin is actually going to start the glycogen chain, and then glycogen synthase can pick up the slack, pick up on once they've got a chain. So what I did was basically I had the students cover, color the phosphates in different colors, whether they're coming from the ATP, the UTP, or the inorganic phosphate. And then I had them think about, okay, the glucose comes into the cell. Well, how's it going to get trapped? It's going to get trapped by being phosphorylated by our hexokinase. And so then they had to take their glucose and they had to take their ATP and they had to like cut them out and then cut off the part that gets added. So cut off the phosphate that gets added and add it on. And then, oh, well, if we wanted to do glycolysis, what would we do? If we wanted to go and we wanted to do glycogenesis, what would we do? Oh, well, if we wanted to do that, well, then we're actually going to have to move the phosphate. So take the tape off, move the phosphate to another position. Well, now what you're going to do, well, now you got to take the UTP and react those. So cut those parts, cut what you see. So you see what gets left over, um, what gets transferred where, and how you end up with kind of phosphates coming from different sources. Um, and then ultimately, then you're going to release those and get another phosphate from the inorganic phosphate. So by coloring them in different colors, you can kind of keep track of that all. I had each student start by making UDP glucose from the glucose that got into the cell. And then I had one person um, take the glycogenin and link their UDP glucose to it, um, well, as glucose. And then I had other students add their UDP glucoses onto that. And so then we talked about how glycogenin was going to put the first few on, and then things would switch over to glycogen synthase. So I had them keep linking up their glycogens, and then we decided we wanted a branch. And so branching enzyme came in and moved things over. And so we talked about kind of like a alpha-1-4 linkages versus alpha-1-6 linkages. Then we added some more onto that chain, and we kind of switched to a whiteboard for a while so that we could draw out even more branching chains. And then I decided, okay, time to break things down. And so then we took in our glycogen phosphorylase and started breaking things off with our inorganic phosphate. But then, oh wait, we hit another branch. So the debranching enzyme came, smoothed things back to the initial chain. Um, but leaving that one glucose that then gets released, and that's your free glucose, not, I mean, like, it's free as in it's not, doesn't have the phosphate group, so for that one, you do have to still go through that hexase kinase step if you then want to trap it and keep it, or if you're in your liver, you just like, boom, go straight out. No need for G6PAs. So, yeah, I think it was pretty fun. They said it was fun. I have had fun, so. The students seem to enjoy it and get a lot out of it, so... I encourage you to try to do the same. Um, so just, you can even take just like a sheet of plastic something so that you can write on charts and erase charts. And then later in the semester, when we go into different pathways, we'll start tracing those. Um, but start with what you knows. So yeah, just an idea.